Welcome, welcome, everybody. Looks like people are coming in. So I'll give you a minute to uh, get settled in, check your audio, make sure everything's working all right. Thanks for joining us today in another Shop Talk uh, episode. This is episode 33. So let's go ahead and get to it because we do have a lot to cover. And we definitely want to leave as much time as possible for questions at the end. Hopefully you'll have a lot of great questions for us. I'm sure you will, as you always do. Uh, if you've been with us before on a shop talk, welcome back. If you're new, um, basically we you know cover a lot of uh, stuff that uh, that's up and coming with Matterport, um, and you know quite answer any questions that, that you might have uh, about the product. All right. So today uh, we have with us Paul Reynolds, director of products at Matterport. Super super excited to have Paul with us uh, because he's been working on some really exciting stuff. Uh, some of the things that we'll be covering, uh, you may have actually already seen uh, in workshop, but we'll go over that. Uh, and that's it. So, Paul, um, thank you again so much for taking the time to, to be with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Cool. So let's go ahead and just get into it. Um, I hope I trust that everybody's you know got things worked out uh, and we'll cover a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so basically, uh, the way I like to the run the, the shop talks is very simple. Uh, we have a Q&A panel. You should see it in the bottom of your, in the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, the Q&A is where you want to uh, put any questions for myself or for Paul. Uh, and that's, that's about it. That's the best place to put questions for us. And we'll get uh, to them throughout the webinar, uh, hopefully, but definitely, you know, we'll have a time at the end for all the questions that you've uh, submitted and don't, you know, feel like you have to wait till the end. Anytime you have a question, uh, you know, top of mind, go ahead and submit it. Uh, we also have with us, uh, Charmaine, who will be able to help out, um, answer any kind of questions that are, you know, more generic, uh, general uh, Matterport related questions that are not specifically for uh, myself or Paul. So use the Q&A for that. We also have the chat function. A lot of people like to use that. Uh, and it's a great place for you to kind of talk amongst yourselves. Uh, not as good of a place to uh, put questions, though, especially for us. That's what the Q&A is for. Uh, use the chat. Uh, you know, to see this as kind of a meetup where you um, kind of get a chance to uh, chat with like-minded uh, Matterporters. So uh, go ahead and do that in the chat. And that's about it, really. So let's go ahead and get going. All right. So for today, we want to talk to you about the trim tool. It's the one thing that uh, you probably already saw in, uh, in your uh, workshop uh, tool list. And we'll cover that. Uh, blur brush. Uh, space search, and we'll talk a little bit about schematic floor plans. So like I said, a lot to cover and let's go ahead and dive right in. All right. Um, all right. So trim, uh, Paul, talk to me. What, uh, what is this magical thing that uh, you created for us? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, it kind of goes by a couple different names, uh, uh, internally, we called it workshop trim for a while. Um, publicly, we call it dollhouse trim. Um, the The shortest possible explanation is it's a way to mask or hide parts of the dollhouse mesh, the 3D mesh that we show in the dollhouse view. Um, it's a visual masking. So we're not actually cutting uh, away geometry in the out of the original capture or scan. Um, and it's only really affecting that dollhouse view. Um, the, uh, has the ability to create these 3d volumes, uh, that can either eliminate anything inside the volume, or you can flip that behavior and say, I only want to show the, I want to, I want to keep what's inside the volume and get rid of anything outside of it, which makes it really handy. If you want a nice neat box around a floor or a particular, uh, part of your capture. Um, and we support, uh, trimming per floor or creating a trim that applies to all floors, By the way, this is, uh, available to all plans. Um, and it, it, it's not, you know, it's not behind a early access flag or anything like that. It, it is out there. Um, we released a, a update to it just last week. And, um, we have one more big update in the works for, uh, mid February, um, that I think a lot of people that have been using the tool as we've gone through this beta period will be really happy with what we have uh, coming out in a couple of weeks. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited about this. I'm going to have to stop my sharing real quick uh, to change things around. I don't think I can change. Let's see here. Okay. 
Um, all right. So basically, as I uh, said before, and didn't realize that I wasn't sharing the right screen, uh, if we have this dollhouse, which we're all very well familiar with, the trim tool is right over here in the bottom, a little pair of scissors. And once you click that, you have access to uh, these little boxes or volumes, uh, as Paul said. And you can look at them, see what's on floor one. So now I think things changed. I don't remember how long ago, but it's a little different where you have a lot more control over the volumes and you yep. can move them this way and you can also uh, rotate them. So this yeah, is rotation something... was a huge request. Um, and it's really handy if you have like a pitched ceiling or, you know, or a vaulted ceiling and, or, yeah. and you have these kind of artifacts going at an angle, uh, you can use one box and kind of turn the, turn the box to make it fit those instead of creating a bunch of little ones. Yeah, I went ahead and rotated this one uh, just because the landscaping here is kind of at an angle. So I yep, that's like, yeah, that's another that. good one. Um, but uh, yeah, so you, I, as you can see, I, I've got one uh, in here. If I go ahead and uh, remove this, I can trash that. You can see there's a bunch of uh, debris and mesh there from, you know, stuff that's on top of the garage here and just random things. Uh, delete all these let's just hide these this is what you know your typical front if you are scanning outdoors you can see that uh you know it doesn't look very clean and neat and sure you can do this with trim lines in capture but what if you forgot uh, or your you know uh, capture tech forgot or anything like that in order to fix that uh, via capture, you got you, you know you'd have to uh, place that trim line in there and then re-upload it. And of course, those are only um, I guess you'd call them like I guess horizontal, uh, not horizontal, like vertical trim lines. They don't work on stuff like ceiling mesh like this. I would not be able to get rid of this uh, clutter up here from the dollhouse with a trim line. It's just impossible. It would eliminate the floor as well. Yeah. And I, uh, just so folks know that this is the post process, you know, what we call workshop. So after you've captured a space, uploaded it, and it's become processed into a space on your my.matterport.com, uh, you go to the space details and in the upper right, there'll be an edit button and that'll take you into this workshop tool. And so, yeah, this is a, this is, uh, I probably should have said that from the beginning. This is a post process trim. Uh, versus the trim that haps, happens in capture, you know, that's pre-processed. So that geometry never makes it to this point. Um, right. that's, so that you, never... you, you kind of get two opportunities. They're kind of two different things. And maybe in the future, we'll figure out a way to combine those. But uh, for now, they're two separate kind of modes of trimming. Yeah. So this is, um, like you just said, uh, uh, unlike the, the, you know, putting it down a trim in capture, which really eliminates that mesh completely from the dollhouse or ever, you know, being created, this is uh, right now just hiding the mesh. It's not uh, affecting, it's not changing the geometry of your dollhouse. It's just kind of masking it. And we, we did have a question um, about invert selection, which is that keep and remove behavior. Yeah. Um, so we do have that capability that came out um, in that release last month. Um, so yeah, if you want to show it real if quick, I go, sure. Uh, if I go here and I'll just add, well, let me get, uh, get rid of all of these. I don't know. I don't know if another I thing folks will notice is the view controls at the top. Um, so this is the first time we've introduced kind of a complex 3d editing tool in workshop and we wanted the ability to control the camera. So we've, uh, created these top and side orthographic views where it doesn't do the perspective and you can snap to these kind of flat on views, which is really helpful for. Uh, yeah. If you want to look at it from the top, if that makes things yep. easier, you can move uh, the box around in more 2d kind of way and I can change the scale. So and a little pro tip uh, there's hotkeys for position scale and rotation. It's four five and six. So if you're really trying to tune a box uh, you'll find that, uh, with this current version, and we're making some improvements to it, um, you'll get your box in position and you'll need to tweak the scale or rotate. And uh, you'll, if you find yourself bouncing between position and scale, uh, you know, you can hit four, five, and six to quickly go between those. Yeah. 
And I also noticed that uh, there are quick keys for top and 3D, but not side. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys didn't put a hotkey for side? Uh, well, so when you go into side, then you can actually uh, rotate through the sides. Um, yeah, got these little arrows. Yeah, and the other thing is, is we have we actually uh, this is just a pro tip in general. There's a lot of hotkeys in Workshop. Uh, we have, there's a support page that lists those. So we're actually kind of running low on keys. <laughs> so uh, we wanted for position, scale, and rotation to be something kind of relatively grouped together. So we fortunately had the number keys. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, if it's something people uh, really need and want, we could figure out something for it. But there's no explicit reason for it. Yeah. Um, and the keep and remove behavior, um, you can either toggle it from what we call the action bar down there, um, or you can do it from the list. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that question that asked about, uh, inverting, I think, um, yeah. that would be how you would do it. Can I have one box be, uh, inverted like this? And then I noticed that there's another little tiny bit here that I would need a second volume. Yeah. Yeah. You can Correct. actually have nested boxes and, um, and we, you know, it gets a little complex if you have a bunch of nested boxes that are different keep and removes. Yeah. Um, but we've got a little rule system for it. So we did test that out quite a bit. So yeah, you can definitely combine boxes and, uh, you know, it's, it, I'm really interested to see what people do with some of these capabilities. This is one of those tools where, uh, we know, you know, we really want, want our, our primary goal was to get rid of the the stuff that you're, you're showing right there, that kind of artifacts and spray, mm -hmm. but we know a lot of people are already using it to kind of isolate an entire floor down to a single room or do some other kind of cool things with it. We haven't even thought of, which is yeah. the fun part of this job. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. So I've got, and so you are limited to how many of these boxes you can create. Uh, it's 10 per floor. And if you use the all floors, if you choose to create a box in all floors, it actually takes away. Like you can see in all floors, I have one uh, trim box right now. And that means that no longer can I put uh, 10 in floor one and 10 in floor two. I'm limited to now nine in floor one and nine in floor two. Um, so using this inverse kind of method, you can really save on the number of um, boxes that you would need instead of putting like four around the house i just did one to cover the whole house yeah and, and I, it's worth uh addressing that that uh the limit on trims is purely for performance reasons so yeah. um you know the way we're masking out this geometry is in real time uh even when it's shown in showcase and even when it's on a, a mobile device so we have to be really careful about the performance we always want the highest possible performance uh, across all the different devices we support, which on the viewing side is quite a bit because we're web-based 3D. So um, we we have, the, the other way you can think about it is we can only uh, reasonably render uh, 10 trims at any given time. Uh, so if you have a single floor selected, we can do the 10 trims assigned to that floor. If you have all floors selected, the, the 10 that are assigned to that group are, are used. And that's why if you move a trim to the all floors group, it counts against each per floor because it'll always be there no matter what floor you're on. Mm -hmm. um, but it's purely for performance reasons. We would love to not have those limits, but it's just the realities of, of web 3d. Um, and, you know, it's something we definitely, we want to see how people use it. We may be able to come up with ways in the future, but we're pretty much to be safe are sticking with these trim limits for a while. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. So we'll take uh, any questions about trim, but let's go ahead and uh, move forward to the next tool here. Uh, Blurbrush. Blurbrush has been with us for a little while. What's, what's different about this? Yeah, so we've got some updates coming to, to Blur. Um, we're going to be um, coming out of our beta status uh, soon. Um, the biggest things that are coming, uh, and, and some of you, we're, we're basically rolling this out progressively, and so it's very slowly. So a, a, a handful of people may have it today, um, and eventually we'll get to 100% deployed. Um, but the biggest things are, uh, we'll be able to apply the blurs to the dollhouse mesh, um, you know, the current version or the previous version, um, you are blurring within the panel only. Uh, and we, and so now we can apply those same exact blurs uh, to the mesh. 
Um, and then the other feature that is coming, uh, also progressively rolling out is, uh, blur suggestions. Um, and we're starting with, uh, detected faces. So, uh, some folks may be familiar with on the capture side, when you go to upload, we give you the option to, for us as a part of our processing to detect faces and automatically blur them as a part of the upload and the processing step. Um, we're taking that, that's from the Cortex pipeline. So from that same technology, uh, instead of having to just do it on upload and it just be applied, um, which is still going to be possible, um, there's going to be this other way through workshop where when you go into the blur tool, we'll actually suggest, hey, we've detected some things that you may or may not want to blur and you have full freedom to accept or reject uh, those suggestions. Uh, and then it'll reprocess. And then uh, with all those features combined, it would also uh, re uh, blur the mesh as well. Uh, nice, nice. I actually have an example of that as well. Okay. I think uh, Charmaine will remember this model. So what that looks like uh, when you come into workshop is you get this little red dot notification in your uh, blur tool. And once I click on that, I've got uh, 769 suggestions available. <laughs> and if I go it's ahead a lot click, of faces. Yeah, it's a lot. And this one, it's a lot. <laughs> and I was really impressed with how it picked up all these faces because I, I mean, I, I would not have recognized, uh, I don't think, you know, any of these uh, people regardless, but it's impressive that it saw uh, some that looked like a face in there and was able to. Uh, get rid of all that. So, but it, I would think like you can click on that and that should what like highlight, um, you know, which, which one that is, if I don't want this one blurred or if, if there's, if it's suggested a blurred that I actually don't want to use, um, would I yeah, be able to just should... easily click on the blur and, and get rid of it? Yeah, and we um, I we should probably do what you're expecting it to do, which is highlight in the list. I, if you click in the list, it'll it'll take you to the it'll take me to the that. one in okay. the list. Yeah, yeah, we should do the we should do the other way of that. So this is still in the works. Um, we're very very close to releasing it, so that might be something we can get in there. Uh, I will say as well that um, the, there was some effort on our computer vision and Cortex team uh, to improve the face detection as a part of this effort. So. Uh, if you have been using um, the face detection and blurring on the capture side, uh, you should see some improvements from that as well. Yeah, that's um, cool. Uh, will it, it, it won't track these faces. And in this kind of environment, it would be very, very difficult. But in other areas, um, you know, maybe with other things, you said right now it's really focused on faces, but in the future it could potentially do other things. Um, would you be able to click on a blur and it'll know to erase that from all the panels that can see that thing, whatever it, whatever it is that you chose not to blur? Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that's the goal. I, the interesting part about suggestions is we're running across all the panels. So the reason why you have, you know, some 700 um, suggestions is because we're detecting faces in all panels and that'll be the same face at different angles in a few cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes in through the suggestions uh, interface, which by the way, this is a, a good moment to pause and, and say, this is the, this is the start uh, of a big effort um, that we want to start introducing more and more of this intelligent processing through workshop uh, through a suggestions style interface. And, and like you're alluding to, you know, we're starting with faces and blur, um, but what that could develop into in the future is things besides faces um, as blur suggestions, but also suggesting other things throughout workshop to make things, uh, you know, more thorough and more detail oriented. Um, but yeah, like we, we definitely, uh, the night, that is the nice thing about the, the mesh blur, the mesh blur will happen against uh, any blur in any panel. Um, but Right now, the the case still remains. If you manually blur, you need to make sure that you're looking from all the panos that that particular thing you're blurring out is getting hit from. So you right. still have to do that. But yeah, that would be the 
that would be the goal. That'd be another goal going forward is to make it where you just blur from one pano and we kind of know that we need to apply that from, from others. It gets a little tricky. Like if you think about uh, if a pano is in a, in a room and around a corner mm-hmm. and you're blurring, um, you know, something in uh, around the corner and then another pano technically would have captured it, but the wall is in the way. So we can't just blindly in 3D space apply blurs because, you know, we would need to know if there's a wall in the way or not for that other pano. So it's a little tricky, but we definitely want to make it work as smooth as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's, uh, that's really cool. Uh, that's a nice, that's a really nice step forward. And obviously in, in that type of environment, I mean, having it automatically find 769 blurs, uh, was very helpful so that I would not have to go and blur every single person in every single panel. Um, yeah, it, there was a question about um, it, it will remain a permanent, you know, it permanently reprocesses the space uh, right now. Uh, we don't have any plans for the ability to roll that back to to the original, but, um, it, you know, that's feedback we're, we're taking. So there's no ETA on the ability to revert. Uh, yeah, blur, blur right, right, right now at least, right. Um, blur is destructive. Once, once you click that apply button, it's it's set. That's it. It actually affects the the panels, and there is no undo once it applies. Um, and blur should I'm pretty blur is available um, to all accounts. Um, yeah, currently, but you, I I don't remember if we changed this behavior recently, but you you do have to make sure it's turned on in your uh, account settings, which is under the manage tab when yeah, you log into my.matterport. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and if you don't check that, you won't, you won't see the tool in, in workshop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eric asked, uh, is this a website or desktop app? Uh, I'm, I'm, I was working in, uh, in workshop, which is a uh, website uh, application. You log into your Matterport account. Uh, you get onto your model page, the model that was processed after uploading all that model data. And in that model page, there's a little edit button. You click that and you get into workshop, which allows you to do um, some editing. Uh, okay, so space search. Talk to me about this. What do we got? Yeah, this is another one that's quickly uh, on its way. Uh, it's not quite out there yet, but we want to go ahead and, and make people aware of it. Um, so space search is, is literally what it sounds like. Uh, you can search, uh, your space, uh, for the data objects that are within it. And, and by that, I mean, matter tags, uh, notes, labels, uh, and actually we'll be able to do measurements as well. Um, it works in both workshop and showcase. And, um, I think that one of the coolest parts about it is, you know, in this example, we've got a space with tons and tons of tags Mm -hmm. and you can quickly, we, you know, as you're typing the query, we are automatically hiding anything that doesn't match the query. And the the thing that I think is really cool is there's a little share button um, up in the query field. And um, if you click that, we give you a URL that can be uh, shared that'll take someone to those search results. So, in this example, if somebody was like, hey, I need to know where all the LED light locations are in this space, um, you you could go ahead and search in the space, find and, and just send them the link to the, that search result. Um, and this also works in uh, showcase or in the viewer uh, side as well. Um, and we'll be uh, rolling out settings options to let you turn this on or off uh, if you don't want it in there. But uh, it appears as a little magnifying glass icon up in the upper left, uh, what we call the title area. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's really simple, but powerful. And there's a lot of interesting, uh, things you can do with it just in this state, but we're, we're definitely, um, this is definitely the start, uh, of a lot of things, uh, we're going to do around data in your space going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and this will be out very, very soon. And this is, this is in showcase. This is not something that uh, workshop or something like that. You don't need to be an account admin. You send a link to somebody uh, and they're just viewing. They, they, you know, first time ever being in a Matterport model uh, and they can use this tool. Yeah. um, And yeah. And, and so the works, the workshop search will always be there for editors, uh, which is, could, could be handy for folks that, 
the, we, we have a lot of customers that work just on the workshop side. They're not always showing a, a virtual tour or doing a, a, a showcase published out thing. Um, but yeah, that the, this is fully, this is fully available on the viewing side as well. Uh, this is really cool. So, um, if you guys have, you know, done a lot of, uh, work in this and I'm guessing you're, you're dealing with, uh, you know, beta testers and whatnot, and this particular model looks like, like a huge retail store. So I don't, I mean, I have no idea what we're looking at here, but it's, it's, it's not a school. <laughs> no, it's a school. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's not uh, a house, right? This is right. not so, uh, have you come across anybody or, you know, any beta testers uh, who are like, this will be great in real estate for this or that, or the other reason I'm just kind of wondering, because I know, you know, we have still a huge footprint in, uh, in RE. Yeah. So, um, I think the, the residential real estate use case, uh, is probably in, uh, the top, the top, lo- top of mind example is, uh, like a larger home, uh, where, you would just search for uh, bathrooms, and if the space is labeled uh, appropriately, you know it'd be a quick way to highlight all the bathrooms in a space mm-hmm. in the dollhouse. Um, the The other part of it is if there are items tagged, so um, furniture. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people using tags to highlight features within the space. Uh, so it it's kind of a quick way to jump around. You know, we don't really have a way prior to this to like zero in on a particular type of tag or a, a specific tag other than kind of looking for it in the either the floor or dollhouse view. Um, so I, I definitely think there's there's some interesting use cases around it for uh, residential real estate. Assuming the space has data to be searched against, I think is the key. So uh, mm-hmm. my hope is, is that uh, this will place a little bit more value on people uh, creating tags and labels and uh, and measurements and and naming their measurements, which is another thing that I think a lot of people don't realize we can do. Um, and because the search is going to start to expose all of these things uh, more quickly to a viewer. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I don't usually label uh, my measurements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I know it's there. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, and this is all, um, all of the, you know, we talked about, uh, suggestions and how we're exposing more cortex stuff into workshop search. Um, you know, I can't speak specifically about all the things we have planned, but we do have a pretty exciting roadmap where we are creating more and more, you know, works. We, we have a tremendous amount of technology on the processing and, and artificial intelligence side of things. And these are all mechanisms to kind of bring that power to an editor uh, through workshop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we'll come up with ways to make things faster and easier. Um, Yeah. If we have the ability to recognize things and suggest things in the space uh, and based on what type of space it is, uh, those are all really exciting things that, that are certainly in our, in our horizon. Nice. I'll, I'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Let, very quickly, I just wanted to cover floor plans uh, because this is actually uh, new and, and very exciting. Uh, floor plans, if you're not aware, are now available from more than just uh, models captured with your Matterport or BLK. Uh, if you're out there capturing with uh, 360 cameras or even your smartphone, you can actually use those models to uh, create a floor plan, which is something that uh, has not been done in the past. Uh, so that's uh, really a step to, uh, to, to kind of broaden the, the use of floor plans and very exciting if you ask me. Uh, also, the ability to order um, express and fast floor plans. So traditionally, the um, time that it took to, to create a floor plan was up to 48 hours. Uh, so uh, I think that's Anytime, I don't think it's like business. No, it's not business. It's any anytime, weekends, and everything, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But now, uh, if you're in a super big hurry, you can order express uh, floor plans and have that back in within six hours. So that's also something that that's very very exciting. And all of that is again in um, I think everything from the starter plan and up. So from starter, a pro business, uh, every every one of the plans that that we have. Um, did regardless of what capture device you use, you can order any uh, a schematic floor plan 
uh, with the you know fast express or regular time frame. All right. Uh, and that's it. So that's what we wanted to share. Now we've got a good amount of time for Q&A. So let's get into it. I'm um, going to go ahead and actually stop sharing. All right. So let me get into the Q&A panel. And uh, Paul, by all means, uh, you've got uh, the Q&A on your end. If you yeah. run across a question um, faster than I can get to it, go yeah, for it. Yeah. Don't yeah, let me hold I, you back. I, I, while you were talking, I skimmed a little bit. There's definitely some we can get to. Um, Someone uh, was asking about the um, the features of the iOS capture app, um, being able to import 360 manually realign. Um, so, uh, but uh, my my actual title is a little long, so I think we've just shortened it for the sake of everyone, Sandy. But I, uh, I'm actually a director of product 3D experiences, which is workshop and showcase. So the mobile app is. Not necessarily, uh, I, I, you know, I work with that team, uh, but it's not my responsibility directly. Um, but I will say that, um, so those functions, those, those features in particular, uh, the ability to import 360 and, and realign are in the Android app. And, uh, you know, that was a way of testing out those capabilities and, and seeing what people did with it. Uh, I, I will speak on behalf of that team and say that there, there is a lot of desire to get feature parity. Uh, between Android and iOS, I can't speak to when, uh, but uh, we're we're certainly uh, looking at how are people utilizing those features and how can we make it more robust for for all platforms. Um, so yeah, so we're w the iOS uh, app will uh, get feature parity at some point, um, but I can't I, I can't speak to a date. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I have no doubt that, that you're right. They're looking for um, feature parity between the two um, operating systems. And uh, it's pretty cool. We had uh, we had a shop talk with that, if you haven't seen it um, in Android. Um, okay, so uh, Jose asked, this This is actually probably more up your alley than uh, <laughs> Paul. Uh, good morning, guys. Is there any chance coming to how, um, is there any change coming uh, to how viewers access the property description, the recent change doesn't invite. Uh, it doesn't intuitively invite someone to click on it. Um, the description. Um, I'm guessing, Jose, you're talking about in showcase where it's up in the top left, uh, in the title there, uh, and sometimes depending on user settings, you have to expand it. Uh, any work on that? Yeah, I think, and I think specifically what they're referring to is. Uh, uh, there was an arrow that kind of indicated that there was more to click on and, and we yeah. bring up the sidebar. Um, so I, I, uh, and I take this as feedback and I've actually already screenshotted the question and sent it back to, <laughs> uh, the design team. Um, so I know we have been working in that area and there, we're definitely, uh, tinkering with that. As, you know, as you notice search, uh, the, the search icon is up in that space as well. Um, so, I don't have any direct response to to that particular one, but I've I've passed it along to the team, and uh, I, I you know uh, this just kind of generally speaking, I, I take feedback of all types really well. I I think it makes us uh, better, um, critical or otherwise. Uh, so so you know all the different channels we we provide, including this one, um, stuff like this goes directly back to the product team. So. That one I don't have a a, a solid answer for, but uh, your feedback has been noted. <laughs> nice, uh, Julie asked a really great question. Yeah, uh, do you use the door trim to essentially cut out the closed door in a dollhouse? Uh, yes, that is exactly why I did that. Um, I scanned that property uh, using a 360, like a Z1, I think, and I, you know, scanned the front yard. The first I wanted the, the door closed. And as you all know, you'd open the door and kind of work your way out. Uh, but that's a problem because it leaves uh, geometry in the way and that complicates navigation and whatnot. Um, and a while back, we came up with this cool little trick where you can use little trim lines in Capture to get rid of it. Caused a little bit of a hole and whatnot in the floor, but it, you know, it, most of the time it would work. Um, you needed to, you know, do things a certain way, uh, but this eliminates all that. You don't need that trim sandwich anymore. You can just use a little trim box to get rid of that geometry. Yeah, and I, I think actually the question right after this uh, is related to that. Um, the the trim that we covered today does just remove uh, or mask uh, in the dollhouse view. 
Um, there was one little mode um, when we talked about keep and remove. There's another option um, that we didn't go into. Uh, so to Andy's question, it's called inside or uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little the little person walking icon on the trim in, in the trim list. Um, and that is specifically to say we want to use this trim in inside mode. So when you navigate from one pano to another or one puck to another, uh, there's that transition where you actually do see the dollhouse between, you know, during that movement. And in the example of the door, now the, the one thing is the trim sandwich may still be useful if you want someone to pass through because the the trims that happen on the capture side do affect the navigation that we enable. Whereas the trim and workshop does not touch the navigation at all. So uh, what it's really intended for in that inside mode case is I've got two panos that show an open door and the, the viewer is going to navigate through that open door, but in the dollhouse, for whatever reason, that door is in the way or closed and visually it looks a little odd. So this would let you turn that trim on um, to, it, it'll also always be on for dollhouse, but It'll this will allow it to be on during that moment of transition and in inside mode, and so it's a it's still just purely a visual trim, but it does play a small role in that inside view. Would that so if it's just masking, um, you still would not be able to see pucks on the other side of the mesh, right? Uh, you would. Um, you would be able to see. So if you if you use the trim box to get rid of uh, mesh in in a door, yeah, you would then actually be able to see the puck on the other side. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't mask out anything, but purely the dollhouse mesh itself, any objects we, and you, you, uh, you could test that by, if you, if you have a, 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 a dollhouse view with a whole bunch of scans and you, uh, you trimmed out everything or made a, a box that trimmed out a lot of stuff, you'll still see the scan points floating in space because. No, the, no, right. But, uh, but like through the door. So if I had, you know, I can't navigate through a wall because there's mesh oh, there. Right. Yeah. And, but if I use a box to get rid of that wall, would I then be able to see the pucks in the other room and trend and transition to them or still no, because the mesh is really still there. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to navigate through. Okay. Um, but the, the visual would be, it would depend on how you trimmed it out, but the, the, that door would be masked out. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's something we, you know, we wanted to see how people use trim. We know it was useful for eliminating kind of like to clean up and neaten up the view. Um, but we are watching how people are wanting to use it for more and more functional, uh, trimming. And it's certainly something we're keeping tabs on. And we know it's something that, that people do want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, I, I do, I do see a future where a lot of that trim functionality between capture and workshop gets blurred a little bit, but for now we're going to keep them separate. Cool. Excited to, uh, to see where that goes. Um, cause I, I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of talk in that, in that area, like manipulating yeah. the, the geometry and mesh in, in different ways, uh, after it's already been processed. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's see here. What else we got? Uh, on, uh, I, on trim browser performance, uh, is it better to make one large trim or several small? We, we put that 10 trim per floor, limit in because that is a safe limit for all uh perform you know our biggest concern on browser performance is is the small mobile devices and the older mobile devices and we tested and so we we put that 10 trim limit in um to be safe uh obviously the fewer you have uh the better um but we feel pretty good that if you have 10 in there that's going to be fine um, but if you are seeing, like, if you are particularly catering to a specific older device or a lower performance device, uh, and you are seeing a performance drop, first of all, let us know. Um, but also try hiding or, or getting rid of some of the trims and see if it changes it. Um, but yeah, smaller, fewer trims are preferred uh, for maximum performance. But uh, we've purposely kept it within limits that we think you can just freely trim within those limits, and the performance is going to be nominal between the the all using all 10 trims versus one trim nice in size doesn't really like one giant trim versus 10 yeah, tiny it, trims it doesn't really matter that much yeah uh cool so there was a question here that we we did answer i just wanted to make sure that uh it, it you know was uh, received 
regarding the little droplets. So that's the blur brush tool. And as Paul mentioned, it does have to be activated in the admin panel. So uh, if you go into your account, if you go up into the top right corner under your name, go into settings uh, and hit manage, I believe the manage tab Yep. right there, you can uh, activate the blur brush. So the admin, if you're dealing with an admin and collaborator kind of structure of, of users uh, who can uh, edit and, and work on models, the admin would have to do that so that the collaborators have access to the blur brush. And if you're a one person show, you are the admin. You are, you are, you are it, stuff. you are everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, this is a great question um, about uh, converting between uh, Revit uh, and, and work with Revit. And uh, uh, there's no secret plans there. We've announced uh, there is a Revit plugin um, for, for Matterport. Um, so that, uh, I'm, that was a few weeks ago. That, that was all made uh, publicly so. and available. Yeah. Um, and we definitely so, yeah. have some uh, on-demand webinars about that if you want to check it out. Um, yeah. Yep. And ex exactly, uh, you know, the question is talking about the work, the work case of, of being able to um, take a capture and bring it into to Revit. Uh, that's exactly what that plugin's for. Yeah. So that plugin can uh, import, I believe, either the matter pack or the BIM files, depending on what you've ordered um, very easily right into Revit. Okay, uh, let's see here. So um, uh, trim boxes for the, yeah, trim, trim is really good for outside captures because mm -hmm. you do get that spray. And I think we covered the question around Around the door, uh, removing yeah. the door uh, related to that. I, I did see a, a question in the general chat around uh, learning more about the trim sandwich. Amir, do you have like a YouTube or something you've created? We, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever created a uh, YouTube video about that. Um, but we definitely used to have an FAQ on it. So if you go to support.matterport.com and just search for trim, I think you'll be able to find that. Also, uh, with regards to Luke's question about shortcuts, go to support.matterport.com and just type in shortcuts in the search field. Uh, you'll be able to find the, the whole list of all the little keyboard shortcuts that we have. There's some good secret ones in there. Uh, yeah, actually, I love, uh, love those keyboard <laughs> shortcuts. Um, okay, uh, let's see, because the new trip will be used to uh, open up accidentally blocked way doors. Yeah, we're... A lot of questions about door. You see how? Yeah, yeah. Trim, trim is people really trim need this for doors. Like, this is a big deal. It is. It is. Yeah. As someone that's done some captures myself, I totally get it. Um, yeah. Right, right now, you know, the easiest thing trim is visual only. We don't affect navigation. Um, is improving control over navigation is is certainly the um, something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, so, uh, but right now that trim, the best way to think about it is you're really just making that dollhouse, uh, visual, uh, look good. It's not, not really for anything beyond that yet. But if you are, you know, some, the, the some fragments and, uh, things like little bits of door in doorways, uh, don't hurt navigation in a way, but they kind of, as you transition from one panel to another, you can see them, you can spot them. And this does eliminate that kind of effect where they have that effect on, on the transition, right? You wouldn't see it if you trim it out uh, when you are transitioning from, from one panel to another. Unless, of course, you do, as you said, is use that little person icon to say, no, 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 just affect the dollhouse and don't affect my inside transition view. So if you, if you can navigate from one position to another, but there's like debris and stuff making that transition a bit weird, the trim would help in that sense, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. A lasso tool. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I. Uh, we we don't have a plan for it. It's definitely something we thought about. Um, you know. Uh, the, originally, uh, the trim tool, like a lot of things, uh, started uh, internally as an internal uh, project uh, at Matterport. We have these uh, hackathons, which actually one starts today, um, where we have uh, a lot of people in the company 
uh, just set aside some time to try some new ideas. And uh, this was a little bit before my time, but uh, uh, you know, somebody started tinkering with trim and uh, a lasso was a part of that idea. Um, it's a little, uh, a lasso in full 3d is tricky. Um, and we wanted to be really accessible. I, one thing I'm really proud of about the trim tool is, uh, I I'm sure a lot of folks, uh, that, that work with Matterport and that are here have some experience in other 3d packages like CAD or blender, uh, and some of these other 3d modeling tools, and they're really complex. And to even do something like, uh, a, a trim, uh, using these really powerful tools, um, it's a big, steep learning curve. So our goal with trim was to, to keep it simple. Like, uh, uh the first version we came out with was it created a box and we put you in a, that flat view, um, to just kind of give people used to this idea of like, Oh, I'm just really working with a box, even though it's a fully three-dimensional cube. And then we had people want to do rotation. And when we introduce rotation, you know, that complicates your views quite a bit. So lasso is a pretty advanced thing. It, I know, I know uh, mentally it feels like I just want to draw a circle around some stuff and make it go away. But uh, when we have all these different angles and working in full 3D space to, to make a, a really accessible, usable lasso, it, I'm not saying it's impossible. Um, it's certainly something we, we, you know, we'll, if we keep getting that feedback, um, we'll, we'll keep looking into. Um, so we, we, we did kick around a lasso, uh, but we felt like this box approach was really powerful for creating nice, neat uh, floor plans and dollhouse views. Um, so no lasso yet. Um, but, uh, that I will take that as a point of feedback. <laughs> yeah. <it's> a, <laughs> it works really well in, you know, in, in Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 2d land, uh, it does work very, very well, but I, I totally see what you're saying. As soon as you add that third dimension, what exactly are you trying to select with, with the lasso? It does complicate things. So that, that's a good point. I, I could see maybe more likely, maybe we introduce other trim shapes besides mm -hmm. cubes, like a sphere might be interesting. Yeah. Um, we don't have plans for that, but um, you know, I, there's definitely things, other directions we could go with trim editing if people want to take it further. Yeah. Um, okay. A few, uh, well, a lot more good questions here. I, I don't, believe we're going to be able to get to all of them. So I do apologize in advance. Um, Diana asked, and I want to try and get to this really, really fast. Um, is this a new feature that you can now scan even if people are moving? Uh, I know in the past, if there were uh, any changes, door open, door closed, it wouldn't let you scan. So no, that, that's not a new feature. It's still uh, tricky. There are just a couple things that you want to keep in mind if you are trying to do that. If you look at the the kind of the our little Keller Williams booth uh, model that I showed, I, I did that scan and it didn't align very well at all, but I wanted to use it just for the sake of the blur tool um, to see you know how that uh, automated blur thing worked. So that's that. As far as the door is concerned, there are some just tricks that you wanna keep in mind. Uh, it's very important to always note that capture always initially tries to align with the last scan position. So if you go around, scan everything with the door closed initially, because uh, that's how you want it, that's great. Then kind of back away from the door, scan a position uh, and open the door. And uh, you can even scan the same position again, just so it has as much overlapping, you know, scan data as possible to align. And then you can move forward uh, and align with every you know, previously scanned position uh, without a problem. You're going to have some scans to hide, so on and so forth. But uh, that that's how you kind of get over the whole door open, door close thing. It's just kind of tricking the system. Um, that's all. And I, you're you're uh, certainly a more experienced and seasoned capture person than I am. But I uh, I found as just a rule of thumb, I just go ahead and do a capture at the threshold of any door that I want to that I want, that I know I want people to go through, which kind of forces me to think about if the door is opened and in what direction a little bit, uh, just cause I, when I first was tinkering around, I had problems where I would capture outside the room and then inside the room. And for whatever reason, you couldn't navigate through that door. So just to be safe, I, if I can, I'll, I'll just capture right there at the threshold of the door. 
Yeah, for sure. When there is no door and you want people to be able to navigate through that at the threshold, um, I also recommend just outside the door and then just inside the door. You have yeah. those two much closer together than what you would normally have. That gives you enough overlapping scan data. Doorways are definitely tricky uh, and you want to maximize that kind of overlapping scan data because they're blind corners. The camera is not going to see nearly as much into the other room or you know out of the room. Uh, so get those scan positions closer together and certainly having one at the threshold. And you can always hide that one later on if it, you know, if you don't want people to navigate to it specifically and they can, you know, just move forward right into the room. So lots of different options, just a matter of kind of understanding a little bit of the fundamentals of how the system works is all. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Will Matterport be compatible with the new Ricoh Theta V camera coming out soon? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you're talking about, there is a Theta V, I guess there's a new Theta V. I'm, I'm guessing so, I don't know uh, for sure. It'll probably take a little bit of a, a time. I know there's a new Reiko Theta X yeah. that's coming out, replacing the Z1. Um, I, th I don't know if it's replacing the Z1. I think it's... Um... It's slightly different. Uh, I um, I don't I don't know the exact specs. It, it it definitely hit our radar when it came out. Again, it's, that's not my team, but I work really closely with those folks. Um, we don't seem to be too concerned. It doesn't seem to be so wildly different that it is going to be a huge concern supporting it. You know, as far but, as I could tell, it's just I mean maybe some resolution changes, things like that, and it's got yep. a nice uh, LCD screen on it. Yep. Um, but I, I don't I don't know as far as optics and and you know, image quality. My impression is the Z1 still a good, that's what I have as well. Yeah. Like it, it's still, it, it's not, I don't know if it'll be good for us certain things uh, and, and maybe not as good as Z1 for others, but I don't, they, I wouldn't see it as a replacement. Yeah. I, I think if you already have a Z1, there's no sense yeah, in upgrading good. to it. <laughs> if you don't have either and you like that yeah. new fancy screen, yep. Uh, maybe worth it. Uh, okay. Uh, do you need to tag everything in order to search it? Um, what do you think? Uh, well, you tag as much as you things you want to be searchable. Uh, the search will the search will search um, tags, notes, measurements, and labels. And uh, right now, uh, all those things are are created by editors of the space. Um, so. Uh, yeah, if if you want it to be a highly searchable space, it's going to currently depend entirely on how many tags or, or pieces of data you put into it. Um, but like I alluded to earlier, um, you know we're gonna we're we're gonna continue to help assist in helping you tag as uh, things that we can as much as we can going forward. Um, but for now, um, it's only going to search anything you've put into the space. So um, this is an interesting one. Paul, um, any effort underway to allow the full screen button to appear and work for tours embedded on mobile devices, or will we um, always need to build and use custom apps to achieve full screen while remaining uh, uh, the website? I, I thought the little full screen button is regard if you have it embedded on. It's always there if you choose for it to be there. It's possible yeah, for let's... the admin to not have it there but by default it's always there right yeah um i that may be an issue just on mobile that uh has popped up um but yeah i don't i don't see any reason why that we wouldn't have we, we don't have a reason why that we don't have that i'm pretty sure we do um but i'll we'll double check it um tours and highlight reels um is something that's also uh something we're going to pay some more attention to uh, sooner than later this year. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll take this as feedback back to the team. Sounds good. Um, why can't you see the notes function in the embed space? I'm trying to figure out, uh, so notes that might, um, it depends on if you mean the SDK, um, version of the space. Um, but keep in mind notes functionality to create a note you need to be an authenticated user. So we know who created the note. Um, so you need to be logged in uh, under your Matterport account and then notes needs to be enabled. 
Um, so you can create notes on the showcase side uh, or on the embed if if it if it's it's just embedded that way um, as long as you're signed in. Um, but we have different we have different people that embed our spaces in different ways. So I'd, we'd need more clarity on on the specific example. Yeah. Um, but usually, if you can't see the notes tool. Um, it's because you're either not an editor of the space or you're not logged in. Right. That's, it does. You don't necessarily have to be in the Matterport account. The space can be embedded anywhere else, but the browser you're using needs to know that you're a authenticated user. You need to be yeah. signed in and, and whatnot. And then you can close out of that tab or whatever. Um, but yeah, you need to be a Matterport user. Uh, let's see here before we take off. Let's try to get to one or two more. Um, will there be a downloadable version of the tour uh, on the product roadmap? When do you think someone will uh, like that could uh, could be available? You know, we we get that question. I'd say probably uh, every day um, when <laughs> I download my my uh, my tour, my Matterport model. Uh, Simple, basically, and no, it's not. It's 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 not a self-contained, you know, video file. This is something that consists of a lot of different pieces, and it really requires showcase uh, in order to put it all together, uh, so a viewer can can see that um, and work with the model and, and all this and that, and, and have all that functionality, and also for the sake of consistency. Uh, if you download the data. And you present it to somebody, one person is going to see it this way because they've got an old, outdated version of Showcase that doesn't yet support Blur uh, and, you know, or Trim or whatever. Uh, and this other person is going to see it the right way. So for consistent, sake of consistency um, and because it's pretty complicated, uh, that's not a thing. And I don't think that's ever going to be a thing personally. Yeah, I Do you have it, anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean we're we're definitely uh especially on the capture side, we know we have a lot of customers in remote areas that are have limited connectivity and so we are sensitive to uh our offline awareness for uh, uh definitely the capture side. Um and I can see that eventually trickling out over time uh to other pieces of functionality. Um, so yeah, us being web-based, uh, brings a lot of flexibility and power and, and all the different devices we can support, but that is the downside is, is, you know, exactly what you described. Uh, we always want the latest and greatest to be loaded, uh, so we can support all these great features and improvements. Um, but I wouldn't, yeah, I, I can't say that there's definitely something coming. Um, but I know it, it, it's something we are sensitive to when we think about these new pieces of functionality. Um, so yeah, it, and like I said, as, as the capture app on the mobile side, you know, we have a lot of people out in the field. Um, there, you know, there may be some opportunity for that in the future. So I wouldn't say never, but I can't say right. when. <laughs> there is a showcase app, and you can yeah, yeah. download models to the showcase app if you need the model to be available for you offline. If you're going to be off the grid or whatever uh, at a you know show where the Wi-Fi is sketchy. Uh, you can definitely download models uh, to your iPad or iPhone. Um, I don't know if Showcase is available on Android. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. No. Okay, uh, and 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 then have those available um, offline. But but it will be on your mobile device only. It's not something that you can. It's not like data that you can download to your uh, computer and manipulate and play with it and all that. There are assets that you can download, just not the whole model. Uh, okay, so sorry, that actually took a little bit longer than expected, so we are uh, out of time, and uh, I really do uh, appreciate all the questions that came in, a lot of really good questions, and I, I, I you know, wanted to get to as many as possible. Um, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, being with us, taking the time uh, to help us, uh, you know, learn more about these new tools and help answer all these questions that our great users have. Yeah, thanks for having me. For sure, uh, for and sure. thank you for all the questions and the feedback. Anything I see that I can relay back to the team, I'm I'm doing it. Yeah, we definitely uh, will will uh, take all the feedback here, uh, record it, and hand it off to you with no no problem. Um, so yeah, next time uh, is I believe March second is our next um, episode uh, thirty four, where we will be uh, I'll be hosting uh, Abhijit, uh, another uh, product uh, manager. 
and talking about uh, the stuff that he's working on. So very much looking forward to that and hope to see you there. So again, thanks very much and uh, take care. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.